I see the French loading their ships. I got the pot of bouillon on the fire. From St. Lucia, a taste of history. This is the officer's kitchen of Pigeon Island. This was one of their big fort and a very important strategic location where they defended St. Lucia. Exceptional meals were prepared for the officers for the British Navy. So let's go to our kitchen today and meet my guests. Chantel. Hi, Walter. Nice, so nice seeing you again. Let me tell you something. Spectacular day we have here. Couldn't be better. Hey, Chef Gunners, how are you? Look here. We have an aggressive menu today, but we're starting off with the first dish. We're going to make a chicken curry that we're going to serve with dal puri. I'm lucky I have a chef today that is from Mauritius in the Indian Ocean, and he's going to show me his secret family recipe for this very unique chicken curry. And how luck has it, I have Chantel here, and she's going to make the connection between India, St. Lucia, and what we're making today. But chef, let's start cooking. You might wonder why this chicken has his, his head on it and his feet. Because in the 18th century, never ever would have been a chicken coming like we get them today in the grocery store. You get it? They always come like that. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to cut out this chicken for Chef Quick. When I worked in India, I had many occasions to work with the local people. And what was interesting is they leave the, the feet and the neck and the bones into the curry. Not necessarily to eat it, just for additional flavor. The most important part is, is that you cut it small enough so that the curry and the, the, the seasoning can penetrate into it. That's the important part. Here we go. Chef, you can start putting your seasoning into it. Chantel, I'm sure you had your share of, of, of curries <laughs> living here in St. Lucia, I'm sure. Absolutely, Walter. I grew up with my grandmother who was Indian. So on many occasions, I woke up to the smells of uh, spices, of burnt curry, etc happening in the kitchen. Every household you go to, every restaurant you go to, the flavor is slightly different because of different seasonings that are added to it. I chopped up the chicken, like I said, you do this before. Chef is going to include the spices. Tell us what you put in as you put it in. It's a ginger garlic. Uh. It's a ginger garlic combination. Now there's some secrets involved, but today we're going to unveil the secrets. So it's ginger, garlic masala. That's a curry powder. Curry powder, there you go. Smells so good already, it doesn't it? Smells very good. It's me back to my childhood. That's <laughs> <laughs> the idea. That's our tandoori marinade. Salt, all right. Mix it up good. Today in the Taste of History, I have a helper. Look at that. That's a little easier for me. You hold this, Chantel, and we're going to put this beautiful pot on our fire. Give it a couple of minutes. One thing that most people don't realize, the amount of heat Bush cooking gives you, that's what we call it down yeah. here. But it's just spectacular. And I just always think that it tastes much better cooking like that than any other way. Put a little oil in there. Look at how fast. Hold on to that. Walter, yeah. this actually reminds me <laughs> of when I was helping my grandmother in the kitchen doing this. This you're is not, fabulous. You're not calling me a grandfather, though. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> Chef, come and look. Now it's ready to add some uh, yep. onion, some garlic. Put yeah. the onions in yeah. there. Oi, Chantel, the smells of that, that huh? That's so good, Walter. I call this the smell of St. Lucia. Curry, curry, and then curry, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a ginger garlic paste. We have some curry powder. Turmeric, a little bit of brown sugar. That's it. There we go. Stew it up good. So now we're going to top it off with water. Beautiful. The flavors is just spectacular. I can wait until he makes the dal puri though, because well, that finishes the yeah. dish. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. So Chantel, when I drive to town and I see still a good amount of roti stand there, many years when I came here, I didn't realize that 
locals leave the bones and the meat. That's the best part of I the I do know chicken, that, but, but, but if you don't know it and the roti is camouflaged, <laughs> it's not so simple. No, the bones uh, make the roti fabulous. So it is the best part of eating a roti. You call it tomatoes, I call it tomato. <laughs> <laughs> Chantel, you're going to steal this for me in a little bit, okay? Sure. Just pretend I'm your grandmother. <laughs> that would be very hard to do, Walter. <laughs> so we're almost ready. Imagine that. Look how amazing it smells. Chantel, I want you and I to try a quick while chef's holding the coriander oh. to, make sure, to make sure it's okay on the salt. I know all the other spices are perfect. Oh, oh my God. It's just uh -huh. fantastic. Here, here. High huh? five, Walter. <laughs> wow, this is awesome. You did good. Okay. Let's put the coriander in. The coriander. Put it all in there. Oh, yeah. Oh, nice heat to it. Beautiful. Like Chantel said, everybody makes a curry, be it whether curry chicken, curry goat, curry conch, all of that. But not too many people make a dal puri. So you had regular flour? All purpose flour. Yeah, yeah. A bit of baking powder. Baking powder. All right. Turmeric powder. Turmeric. Salt. All right. A bit of oil. Now we need water. Some water. So making the dalpuri dough. We need some more water to just take all the flour. You just gotta make sure that you have enough liquid in there so the dough is manageable, it's like any dough you make. Think of a pasta dough, it's a bit of the same thing. The lentils go in the middle uh -huh. of the dal. It's done when it's all whole together. So his dough is perfect now. Now he's going to make it into a small it. bowl. A small bowl, then yep. we shall stuff it with a dollar. Watch that. That's the trick. That's why you buy it and I buy it, because we don't, this is too much work. Absolutely, <laughs> and we're too busy yeah. for some of this stuff. It's too much work. Take a look at that. Just a dollar. Those are the lentils raw. Those are the lentils cooked. Stuffing with a dollar. Down. That's why I'm like you, I'm, I'm, I'm buying them. <laughs> but this is what makes the trick, and this is what the flavor comes in. You can put the tower now on. Okay, no problem. Please. Don't burn yourself. Now, gentle rolling that if you want to, because if you push too hard, it'll open up again and it comes out. Look at how nice. You've done this a few times, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> it looks like it. <laughs> Dal master here. Do you want a slow sure. fire for that? Because too much fire will be burned before it's cooked inside. So I'll cook a little bit more. Our spectacular meal is served thanks to the master Dalpuri man. This is one thing I learned. And every time I cook on different locations, I learn something I take back home with me. And I'll tell you today what I'm taking back is the flavor of that curry because I have never, and I mean it, had a better curry than that. I thank you, thank you for sharing thanks. your recipe. And Chantel, Without you, God knows what would have happened. I can't wait to have some of this curry, but I'm going to have it the old-fashioned way. Like me. I'm not going to use a spoon like I know, you. I know. I'm going to dip wow. it in and do it the way that I did it when I was a child. The reason I use a spoon, I get too many emails from people saying, what do you use with your finger in your mouth? Well, now you have an <laughs> excuse. You use your, your finger and you do yeah, it directly. Oh. oh, my God. So let's see this beautiful and historic place that we cooked in today. In 1781, Washington sent what remained of his beleaguered troops for a surprise attack against British forces stationed in Yorktown, Virginia. With the help of the French, Continental soldiers surrounded Yorktown, trapping Lord Cornwallis and his British troops in a siege. Cornwallis's only hope was from British ships arriving from St. Lucia. The fortress was important because it played a very crucial part in your revolution. The island was important because this was the key to the strategy of the whole Eastern Caribbean. The French had a big base next door to the north and the British in more time captured St. Lucia from the French so that it can spy on the movement of the French fleet. The British took its 10 best regiments in North America, 6,000 men, landed in the cove to the south, overran the cove, overran the water, and came and established themselves here. So between 1778 and 1803, the British were here. The Americans did not have 
a navy. Most of the fighting on the sea was done by the French. And actually, the battles of the American Revolution took place in these waters, not in American waters. Two famous naval arch rivals occupied these neighboring islands. On Martinique, it was the Comte de Grasse, the head of the French Navy. And nearby on St. Lucia, it was British Admiral Lord Rodney. These two expert seamen battled each other on the high seas for years. The importance of that was such that once the French joined the war, Britain moved its 10 crack regiments to garrison this place. They captured it from the French and kept it throughout the war. The story is Rodney used to go on top of that hill. He sat there under an awning looking for the French. So he had this telescope because you can see the smallest boat yes, yes. leaving. Yeah. Yes, Martinique right yeah. on the horizon. But in August 1781, Rodney was in Europe and missed seeing his arch enemy, French commander of the fleet de Grasse, sail 28 ships of the French line north from the Caribbean. The French, in coordination with General Washington, attacked Rodney's British ships at the entrance to Chesapeake Bay. The larger French fleet badly beat the British, who were forced to pull their ships back in defeat. Lord Cornwallis had no option but to surrender. The coordinated efforts of the Americans and the French had paid off spectacularly, causing the final decisive battle of the Revolutionary War. It has been called the most important naval victory of the 18th century. And after that battle, then you came to peace terms and America eventually got its independence. But this was key to the strategy of war on the sea during the American Revolution. Amazing history here in St. Lucia. Seven times occupied by the French and seven times by the English. Lucky for us, there's a lot of culinary prowess still left over from the French. And today, we're making a typical St. Lucian one-part meal, which is called bouillon. And to help me execute this meal is Chef Michael from Sandals La Talk. Chef, doing, chef? it's good to have you here. You know, we raised the bar earlier when we made this fantastic curry and the dal puri. And now I got you here, so we're going to show them how this dish is done. It's a simple dish, but don't underestimate the simplicity. you got to follow directly. The dish we're going to make today, Chef Michael and I together, can be made a couple different ways. And actually, a lot of people have improvised over the years and whatever they could find kind of put into it. Mm -hmm. But it's done many times with pork, but today we're going to do it with beef. What's interesting about it is we all forget that the 18th century didn't have refrigerators and freezers and what else have you. So salt curing was a very, or maybe not the only, but one of the many ways to preserving it. Now this piece of beef has been marinated in salt for three days. If you make this recipe at home, you're gonna find out if you have a five pound roast and you salt it for three days, guess what? It only weighs two and a half pounds because the salt acts as a dehumidifier and a preservative. The way this dish works, you take the beef, you cut it up, you have already a stock on the fire that we already have there. Michael's gonna cut up the beef. I'm gonna walk it over to our stock. And then Michael is going to cut me with some garlic, some carrots, some onion. And today we found some beautiful ochre this morning in the garden. So we're going to use some ochre into it. Some people that I know, and I know a lot of St. Lucians and have eaten in their homes, also put plantains into it. Like I said, whatever you like in this dish, you kind of can put into it. All right, Michael, I'm going to put this into the bouillon. We know this dish a while from French cooking, and obviously in French cooking you would have uh, fine brunoise or julienne, but here it's the hardiness of the, the one-part meal, so it's just a rough chop. It's a real nutritious meal. You have kidney bean, you have carrots, you have onions, you have garlic, you got seasoned peppers, you could have plantains in there. Today we found some okra, we put some okra in it. It's a delicious, delicious meal. And obviously in the end, the dumpling is the one that puts it all together. So, Mike, how you want the okra cut in your recipe? Uh, Just uh, cut them on a bias, yeah. Onion, garlic, carrots. Checking on the kidney bean. Yep. Chef, test it. 
So ready? Let's put the whole pot right into our bouillon. All right. Remember, the officers will have a lot of hunger here, a lot of soldiers here. All right. All right, chef, let's taste, let's taste our stock. Remember, when you make this dish, you want to be very careful on the salt because the, the beef is salt cured, so you got to really make sure that you don't put too much salt in it, otherwise it would be impossible to eat. Let's see here. That's good. Good flavor. Our bouillon is moving very nicely. Now comes the time to put the dumplings in there, which is obviously something very unique. And it's so simple because all of this is flour, salt, and water. What we have here is two point of all-purpose flour and a cup of water. And then we're going to add a teaspoonful of kosher salt to it. A cup full of water to add to the dough. As you see here, Chef Michael, it's very simple dough. You just yeah. don't want to overwork it. Bench flour right here. Okay. We're just going to roll it out, similar like a pasta. We're going to cut them up into one inch thick, pretty much. I have some, some time I'm trying to get into the bouillon. I got some seasoned peppers. They look like a habanero, but they have no heat. That's why they're called seasoning peppers. They just have a lot, a lot of flavor. You add them into it, it gives this extra distinctive flavor. So the seasoning pepper goes in. Chef is gonna put a little bit of the uh, coconut milk over there. Okay. Put a little bit into the fantastic uh, bouillon. Seasoning peppers. And then the dump is separately in throw them in, yeah. Mm -hmm. It looks very good, very inviting. Let's get a taste. Yeah, man. This dish pretty much comes from the roots of part of the African and the Caribs and the Arawak Indian. And a little and, French. And a little French, so yeah, that's what makes it so unique, you know. It's a different influence from a lot of other Caribbean islands that we have here. The flavors are just spectacular. Look at all the colors in there. Unbelievable. Get one of your dumplings in there. Look at that. Let's take this opportunity to learn more about foods of St. Lucia. When I was a child growing up in the Black Forest, I'm used to the bananas with stickers from St. Lucia. And here we are in a banana plantation. St. Lucia bananas are priced the world over. Cotton sugar cane is no easy work, as you can see. And here, we're gonna cut myself a piece. See, I'm peeling it. That is sweet. Once the sugar cane is harvested, you then take it to extract the juice. I went to Dunkin' did a lot of hard work, so I can enjoy this beautiful, fresh squeezed uh, sugar cane. It's unbelievable. What a, what, a, what a flavor. And what an ingenuity the people had. Poor Dunkin', however. Oh boy, beautiful. A lot of work, but good in the end. Delicious, very refreshing. The story of chocolate begins right here in the rainforest of St. Lucia. The cocoa beans get first fermented for about three weeks. Then they get put on these beds to dry. When they are dry completely, then we got to take off the, the outer husk. By the way, they're called in the 18th century the cocoa bed. The recipe I'm making today is a banana fritter 
But what's unique about the banana fritter is the glaze that I'm doing with the molasses and changing a little bit of curry and rum. It's a spectacular, spectacular dish. I recommend you to make it someday. We want to start off making a beer batter. What a beer batter is really, is just all-purpose flour, cornstarch, a little bit of baking powder, and believe it or not, ice cold beer. Now today, I'm actually using the local beer of St. Lucia called Piton. It's a beautiful light lager. And all you want to do is whisk that under your flour mixture. The beer has to be extremely cold on that. It doesn't require any eggs or anything else that's binding. It's the cornstarch and the all-purpose flour that does the trick. You cut the banana, about two inches or thereabout is a nice size. We'll take a skewer and stick it into the banana. So you cut them in half if you like. Now they don't take long at all, but you gotta make sure that you have ripe bananas. And all you wanna cook them now until they get golden brown. Look at that, nice beer batter. So obviously I have my fritters right over here, but now what makes this recipe sensational is the glaze I'm doing. There's two ways you can do the glaze. You can heat up the molasses or you can just use them room temp, which is even sometimes better. So I have molasses in here. I have a little bit of curry, well, not too much, just a couple of pinches. Freshly chopped ginger, which is very important. We all know that rum, bananas, and sugar all likes each other. So this recipe now, it's asked for a good rum. I want to give it a taste, make sure I have enough curry, not too much curry. Unbelievable. A little bit more curry could use though, a little bit more ginger. The dish is done, so simple. All I got to do now is put a little bit of the glaze over. Just a little bit. Hey, Walter, I smell something fantastic. I had to come in to join to have some of this. Let me tell you, this is old St. Lucia. St. Lucia bananas, St. Lucian beer. What can be better than that? Tell Nothing, me. Walter. You, try that, though. That looks so good. It's, it is good. Fantastic. Mmm. Hmm. I'm speechless. And I don't, I'm not speechless very often, Walter. <laughs> I know that. So this is so good. <laughs> So we should rename this dessert. It's going to be from now on called Bananas Chantel, in your honor. No longer Bananas Walter. Oh, I'm melting, and it's not because of the sun. <laughs> Banana Chantel, right here in St. Lucia. What a fantastic day I had today cooking here in St. Lucia, right here in this historical setting of Pigeon Island. We started off with a curry, dal puri. We made a one pot bouillon, and obviously the Banana Chantel to finish. Fantastic. Love you, St. Lucia. And you. <laughs>